Welcome to All Around Britain, the show that celebrates exciting places and amazing people right across this great country of ours. This week, we're at Silverson to explore the home of British motor racing. We'll be testing our driving skills on one of the world's most famous circuits and getting up close to some of the greatest race cars ever built. Yeah, I can't wait, but this is far from a show just for racing fans. We'll also bring you lots of fun and inspiring stories to help give you a lift this Sunday as we go all around Britain. Coming up, from the track to one of the country's longest continuous flight of locks, we find out how to navigate Cane Hill in Wiltshire. We're losing count already. <laughs> Eight centuries old and still going strong, we go behind the scenes to see the vital work preserving this beautiful abbey in Monmouthshire. And find out why this 80-year-old retired army major is sailing around the country in a homemade boat. People are laughing and smiling at me, and um, I have a great fun in chatting to people on the towpath. But first, Alex, can you believe we are standing at the starting grid of one of the most famous racing tracks in the world? I really can't. I can just imagine the sounds and the smell of rubber on race day. Love it. Yeah, imagine 140,000 <laughs> fans trackside. The atmosphere must be electric, just as it must have been back in the early days of racing. Built on the site of a Royal Air Force bomber station on the Northamptonshire and Buckinghamshire border, the first race at the deserted airstrip was in 1947, organised by a group of local car enthusiasts. Spurred on by a huge surge in interest for motorsport, just a year later, Silverstone hosted the British Grand Prix and the first World Championship Formula One race in 1950. Among the spectators were King George VI and Princess Elizabeth. Since then, Silverstone has staged the British Grand Prix more than 50 times, and the layout of the circuit has undergone major changes to reduce speed and increase safety. The circuit also has its own museum, where you can see racing memorabilia and cars from some of the track's most famous racing moments, past and present. Later in the programme, I'll get to experience the track's twists and turns at an eye-watering 150 miles per hour. Try not to end up in your seat. You can sit if you want. <laughs> and Ria and I will put our drifting skills to the test in a head-to-head -head challenge. <laughs> That looks amazing. You know you're not going to beat me at that, right? Uh, have to wait and see. <laughs> right, let's take our first trip around Britain this week. Now, a lot of work happens here to keep the track ship shape, but how do you keep a building that's more than 800 years old standing? Sean Fletcher's been to see the vital preservation work at Tinton Abbey in Monmouthshire to discover the wonders of the Wye Valley. It's been standing proud overlooking the River Wye for over 800 years. Tintern Abbey was built by the Cistercian monks in 1131. At first, it was just a simple timber construction, but with the patronage of the Marcher Lords, a much grander, more dramatic building was created. Jonathan Berry is Cadu's ancient monuments and archaeology expert. Well, John, this is a wonderful place, and it's so atmospheric, isn't it? It is. We're located in the Lower Wye Valley. We've got these wonderful trees on the valley sides and the River Wye going past us. Absolutely fantastic location. With special permission to go inside the abbey and wearing protective gear because of concerns about crumbling masonry, we're able to take a closer look at the conservation work that's been carried out for over half a century. It's so worth it from the carpet of daisies that greet you to the soaring arches above. There's some dates on some of the, the stones, and some of the stones look different to, the, you know, there's larger ones, there's smaller ones. What's that yes. about? Yes, oh, well, you've got a keen eye. Yeah. So um, this goes back to the first decade of the 20th century when the architect from Gloucester Cathedral oversaw conservation works here, and he left behind date stones. Um, so you can see 1904 just here. Tintern is not only famous for its beautiful abbey, the River Wye is the fifth longest river in the UK. 
but I'm not on the river today. I'm meeting a cyclist who's promoting new routes, exploring this lush green landscape. Jack Thurston is championing the joys of a slower pace of life. It's very accessible cycling. You know, if you go at your own pace, you can cover quite surprising amounts of distance, even if you're just taking it really easy. There's stuff all around if you're just willing to slow down and explore. There's a railway line that they used to run all the way up the Wye Valley, and uh, very recently the route to Chepstow, or near enough, has been opened up. It took them years to do it, but it's finally been done, so you can cycle traffic-free from nearby Chepstow along the old railway line, not much in the way of hills, and then uh, over here and into Tintern. I can't resist a quick look at the new route on the other side of the river. Well, I've crossed the border and that road takes me further into England, so I'm going to head back to Wales now. So I'm heading back to Tintern to get to this cafe, which has become a hub for cyclists Rusty and Kay Morris, Simon Woolley and Rich Wyson. We're very lucky we live in a lovely part of the world and, and lots of the roads around here are, are fantastic and changing through the years. So um, just, just the main run down to the valley between sort of Chepstow and up to Monmouth is, is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, so it's for, me, for me, I'm a mountain biker, so I ride a lot of the trails in this area from Chepstow to Monmouth. And, well, basically they're endless. So fueled by coffee and their enthusiasm, I join them for a brief ride along the beautiful river. And we can't resist one last look at the Abbey. Now this track has seen some of the best Formula One moments ever, but essential to those race days are the marshals. That's right, an army of 700 volunteers play an essential role in safety at Silverstone from the pits, paddock and trackside. To find out more, we're heading to the assembly area to meet Callie Plant, who has been a race marshal for 10 years. Callie, it's so lovely to meet you today. I thought myself and Rhea had great jobs getting to come <laughs> to places like this and film, but you're here all the time. Tell us what you do. Well, it's a volunteering job and we're mostly here every weekend. I'm out every weekend somewhere. I'm currently in Silverstone, I work in the assembly area. So we greet the cars and we get them all ready to get onto track, ready to race, all ready for their qualifying and practices. So what's the atmosphere like on, on a race day here? It's, it's just bang, 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 it's just like continuous. It's quite electrifying, it's quite good. You don't get a chance to breathe, really. Callie, I love the fact that you're not how some people might imagine a typical race marshal to be. How did you get into motorsport? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it was my husband when I met him back in 2000. He was a sponsor for one of the drivers and I started helping with the catering. Right. And the, somebody suggested marshalling to me, which I never thought I'd ever get into marshalling because everybody assumes you've got to be not being funny, but you know, like mainly boys. So you, it's yeah. important to you to encourage girls and women. To yeah, from all boys. backgrounds as well, and all colours and shapes and sizes as well. So it's nice that um, I get this opportunity. So, Callie, we've got some flags here. What do they mean and what do yeah, they represent? All different colours. Well, green obviously is for go. Red. Stop. Stop if there's a red flag, if there's an incident. Okay. Um, and obviously check it at the end of the race. Take it away, like what do we do? The way I was taught yeah. is to do it in a figure of eight. So you go up. Oh goodness, you did that so quickly. Oh, you're so, good. Imagine without it, if you do a figure of eight. Yep. You go first then. Okay. Brilliant. Woohoo! So... <laughs> I think we'll all see Can that. Can I get a job? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Once the cars are ready, you get a radio call to say release cars to greet, and that your cue is to wave okay. your flag to the car. Release the cars, cars to, to greet! Last car, number five, last car, number five, gone through. <laughs> Brilliant. Is that good? Fantastic. <laughs> <Yeah>. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I think I'm going to have to work on my flag-waving <laughs> technique. At times it was just a bit erratic, but it's just so good to see how much marshalling means to Kelly. 
There's just so much passion in there. Well, two brothers from Manchester who also very much share that passion for motorsport have started a project to make the sport more accessible. Joshua Stokes has been to meet them. It's loud and it's fast, but is it inclusive? For Niall and Blair, motorsport is their passion, but working in the industry hasn't always felt possible. In a recent report commissioned by Lewis Hamilton, findings suggest just 1% of employees in Formula One are from black backgrounds, something which the brothers hope to change with the Blair Project. I was inspired by my former kart racing brother, Blair. One of my goals, as well as being a racing driver, is that I'd love to give back to other young people who've been in the same position as me. Motorsport is very expensive, and as a family, we didn't have the £2 million spare to get him to the highest echelons of the sport. It was costing my family anywhere from 25 to 30 grand a year, and for a lot of families, that's just not affordable. We can bring uh, racing to the cities instead of uh, locations where uh, families can't get to. It just gives uh, these people the opportunity to get involved and it just, uh, just means that communities can just uh, get that experience of motorsport. The brothers have been working on their project at tracks like this one, offering hands-on experience to those underrepresented through modifying and racing go-karts, an opportunity that for many may have previously felt unobtainable. We call it the see me, be me effect. If you see somebody that looks like you, in a certain career or pathway, you can then dream and think you can do that. They can then see themselves in us so that we can basically encourage that new uh, generation to go down this uh, career path and maybe eventually work in a place like Formula One as well. Back at the track, they're used to seeing young racers chasing pole position. Once you put a helmet on, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what background you're from, it just matters what you can do behind the wheel. Karting in itself is probably the most pure form of motorsport. It's literally, in essence, you, four wheels and an engine. You do get quite a lot of young lads who have seen the likes of Lewis Hamilton, Jensen Button and George Russell coming through the ranks because obviously that's where they started. Familiar names that are now inspiring others of all backgrounds to get behind the wheel. Motorsport's a family, and no matter where you're from, no matter who you are, there is always going to be a place for you on the grid. Young people from around the world or in the UK or from a black background can see people that look like us and think, right, I want, I know that this is possible. And it's projects like Niall and Blair's that are helping to make that a reality, driving change from a young age. Great to see what those guys are doing and just being here and hearing the sound of the cars going by on the track. It's got me revved up for later on. Me too. But before Alex Hamilton here takes a chequered flag, time now for a quick break. Still to come, the rodents helping to restore natural habitats in Northumberland. Plus, I'm joining racing driver Steve as he puts his foot down. That was 155 miles an hour there. 155. That was quick. Yeah, that was very quick. Welcome back to All Around Britain and to the Silverstone Circuit here in Northamptonshire. In a moment, I will be experiencing 0 to 60 in 4 seconds in this but before that, we're off to the northeast to see how rodents are playing a vital role in restoring habitats. Yes, voles are being introduced into England's largest forest in Northumberland. And Ross Hutchinson's been to see the project in action. Hidden away in the depths of Kielder Forest, a beautiful, tranquil setting. that's about to get a burst of life. There's a delivery, over a hundred of these native water voles. This area should be teeming with them, but decades of intense agriculture, land management, and the accidental introduction of predators like the American mink have seen numbers plummet. 
And that's bad news for places like this. These rodents are not just cute faces. Water voles are a key part of the ecosystem. They're a prey source for multiple other animals, but also they create little microhabitats. They change the structure of the river banks and creating habitats for loads of other, other little smaller insects and invertebrates. This is the Restoring Ratty project. And this is their final release, a day that will see their 2,000th foal introduced into these waterways, but only when they're ready. Lining the water here, we have loads of release pens like this. Now, these are filled with straw, bits of food as well. The voles then get put in these, they're monitored for a few days, and then gradually, when they're ready, they'll be released. Once the pens are prepared, there is one thing missing. Using specialist equipment, well, a bin bag and an old crisp tube, the final water voles are given a final check. Um, no obvious signs of injury or disease, so this one looks pretty good. So before it gets too stressed, I'm just going to pop it into the release pen. Although this is the last planned release on this stretch of water, it's not the end. We are not the only ones here to see how this all works. Uh, they sort them out into groups as family groups. This project has been so successful that representatives from organisations, including the National Trust and Forestry England, are here to watch, to take notes and to get involved. Why is no one else falling down that hole? So these won't be the last releases we see. Water voles are making a comeback. And a select few sooner than others. Some of the voles don't have to wait. Some of them all grown up, braver ones get to go out straight away. Yeah, so most of the voles have you've seen are in the release pens and they're young and a soft release really suits them. But the adults who um, are, are alone can go out straight away. Hello, there he is. <laughs> it doesn't take our brave vole long to understand the mission. A textbook reintroduction. Look at that. He's really, really behaving for us. That is amazing. This is a good day for you. As he swims off to start his new life, observed by all those hoping to carry on this good work, it is hoped the lessons learnt here will mean more water voles in more locations, improving our waterways and our environment. What a great idea, and they're quite cute, aren't they? Right, Alex, you've got your helmet. Are you ready for a drive you'll probably never forget? Oh, not going to lie, I am nervous, but my heart is racing at the thought of experiencing <laughs> this thrilling, <laughs> iconic track. I mean, wow! Here it is. I'm getting strapped into an Aston Martin Vantage. Its high-powered, four-litre, twin-turbocharged engine and eight-speed gearbox means this supercar can hit speeds up to 195 miles per hour. Driving legends from James Hunt to Lewis Hamilton have raced this three-and-a-half-mile circuit. And taking me for a spin is instructor Steve Warburton, who has been working at Silverstone for more than 20 years. Steve, this is like a childhood dream. It was on the bucket list and we are about to do it. How fast are we going to go? I'm going to go absolutely flat out, but I think on the straights, we should just get to about 150. Wow. OK. And um, just a quick question before we actually go. Have you ever crashed? I can't tell you that. <sighs> Let's go. Here we go. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. The car kind of moves a little bit as well when you're going Stop along. Bricks. We're on cold tyres. Right. So, so do you need to warm them up first or...? They'll get warm all right, Alex. Ooh. Ooh, OK, this is how you do the corners. Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! OK! How do you know where you're going? This is Abbey. So this is the first corner that a Grand Prix driver would see. This wow. takes us into Farm Corner, because this is where the farm is. So look how tight it is. You've just got to really get the that car organised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying not to end up in your seat. You can come oh. and sit here if you want. <laughs> into the loop section, hanger straight. So this is where the two hangers were in the, in the wall. Right. That was 155 miles an hour then. 155? Yeah. A little bit jumpy there. Yeah, that was a bit jumpy, Steve. <laughs> and then obviously this is the grid for F1. Oh. So that was quick. Yeah, that was very quick. Cars have changed so much over the years. Obviously, we've got electric cars on our 
normal roads. Do you, do you ever think there'd be a time when, you know, racing could take a massive leap of faith and we could actually see more electric cars on the track here? It's already happening. I mean, we've got Formula E, so it's already happening, Alex. And I must say that um, the performance of those cars is pretty impressive. And the technology is moving so fast. I'm really impressed with how calm you are. I mean, I feel, oh, trying not to swear, Steve. This is a Sunday morning <laughs> show. <laughs> oh, Steve. Now we're getting some tire temp now. Can you feel the grip? Yeah, I can feel the grip. That was at like 120 miles an hour then. Around the corner? Yeah, he was trying to go sideways. Woo! Oh, Steve, you beast. Steve, this was an amazing experience. Ah, no problem, pleasure. I tell you what, that was the ultimate thrill-seeking experience. That was one of the best <laughs> things I have ever done. As Alex recovers from that once-in-a-lifetime experience, let's head to the Isle of Sheppey off the coast of Kent now, where Stacey Poole's been to see some wonderful wildlife and stunning sunsets. Sunrise over Elmley Estate and this nature reserve comes alive. The views and the wildlife are just breathtaking and standing here on the edge of the marshes, you get a front row seat. It is just magical, the sunrises here, and that's when the wildlife is its most active. We have the most incredible wildlife and the most incredible wildlife spectacles to see. This nature reserve is unique. It's the only one in England that's family owned and managed. Created by Georgina's family over decades, they wanted others to be able to enjoy it. So they embarked on creating sympathetic accommodation. It was so important to share it and have that experience of waking up to that sunrise. The huts and the tents have all been positioned to maximize the view, a wildlife spectacle outside your window. So much to see. Um, it's really just about sitting and enjoying it. And I think for us, that's been a really important part of our purpose is to create something that is gonna bring more people into nature. Over the past few years, they have completely transformed this estate. The derelict farmhouse has been completely renovated. It was a derelict building for a huge number of years and was almost falling down and it's such a beautiful building and was really the heart and soul of the farm. So it was so important to us to bring it back to life. There's so much history on the island. I think that's the amazing thing about the island, which needs to be appreciated more, is just the amount of stories and the sense of community here. It's hard to imagine a more wonderful place to work or to relax. The light, the landscape and the abundance of wildlife make Sheppey a very special place. It really is hard to beat views like this. Wow, after that heart racing experience, those pictures are welcome and calming. <laughs> Time now for a quick break, but there's still plenty more to come. We meet the blogger from Tenby, encouraging more people into the world of adventure sport. And we'll be getting to grips with the art of drifting. <laughs> Still to come this Sunday. The zookeeper going back to school to learn more about whiskers. I wanted to give back to them the amazing life that they've given me. And we'll be wheel spinning and doing donuts on Silverstone's drift course. But before that, let's head to Tenby. Charon Preet Carer has been to meet the blogger with cerebral palsy who's determined to inspire others. 
Paddling through Pembrokeshire waters, Jacob makes kayaking look easy. He loves trying new sports and he's got a competitive side. From a young age really, I'm, I'm a twin, so from being with my twin brother and around the friendship group that I've got, I've never been treated any differently. So I felt like I'm always in a competition with them in terms of I want to keep up with them and keep up with an able-bodied person. Jacob has cerebral palsy spastic diplegia and he loves a challenge. Is that your brain sends messages to your legs three seconds later than yours would, which obviously affects my coordination, balance and stability. Um, but I like to try new things, take on new challenges. Yeah, all through your I just like to throw myself in the deep end and give it a go. Like When I'm out of my comfort zone, that's why I feel like what brings the best out of me. When I was a child, I'd say around 11, 12. To some, I may have seen happy and things, but secretly inside, I didn't really accept my disability and what my capabilities were. And that was something I had to come to terms with as I got into my youth and teens. My mind frame automatically switched. Like, the biggest disability for me, really, is a negative mindset. Jacob began pushing his limits, teaching rugby and boxing both to people with disabilities and those without. Society places so many limits on disabled people. You must get people coming up to you and saying, how are you doing this? When I was in university, I had that on a daily basis. I was doing a rugby coaching degree and you'd often have kids, children, who'd be looking at me, probably looking at me stupid, thinking, why is he coaching rugby? or why is he coaching me rugby, I can run around, he can't. But if you've got a good mind and you've got a good knowledge on that sport or what you're trying to put across and you can use your, your tools that are around you or use other people to demonstrate, then why not? Why not is a question Jacob lives by. He has a travel blog that makes adventure accessible to everyone. It's not often you hear of a uh, disabled persons travelling around Asia or travelling to Australia. And that's what I want to do, is trying to open the book on that, really, and prove to people you can do that. Now Jacob wants others to experience his love of adventure and his home in Pembrokeshire. That's why he's planning a different kind of sporting event for disabled people. What I'm trying to produce is something that's never been done before and it's outside the box. There's the Paralympics that are available and there's obviously comp there's a wide variety of competitions, but what I'm trying to do is stretch that and be inclusive to everyone. And if other disabled people were watching this today, what would you want them to think? What would I want them to think? I don't really want them to think. I want them to get out there and do and just try. Because what's the worst thing that can happen? You can fail and failure means nothing really. You fail and keep on going. It's been a long road for Jacob with obstacles along the way, but he shows no sign of stopping. What a great attitude from Jacob. Never be afraid of failure. I love that. Well, we'll see how we get on when we go head to head drifting cars a little later in the programme. But now we've come inside the Silverstone Interactive Museum to see some of the most famous cars and bikes that have played a part in the track's 70 year history. Yes, take a look at this Lotus from 1981. Now, in the 80s, designers were finding ways to reduce drag and increase speed. And this was one of the first cars to be made extensively from carbon fibre, the material that's now a standard for all Formula One cars of today. In a huge 4,000 square metre former aircraft hangar, the Silverstone Interactive Museum houses some of the most significant cars and motorcycles to have raced and won here. From Nigel Mansell's iconic 1992 British Grand Prix winning Red 5 to McLaren's 2000 Formula One car, which was raced by David Coulthard, all the way to emerging electric cars such as this Audi e-tron Quattro, which was used in testing for the World Endurance Championships. Barry Sheen's 1979 British Grand Prix Suzuki motorbike is also here, along with one of his helmets. And if you look closely, you can see the drilled holes so Sheen could smoke without taking it off. Sir Lewis Hamilton has donated one of his helmets to the museum too as well as his overalls worn during last summer's world title winning season. But the most stylish racing suit here is based on a design by Chanel and was worn by 60s Mini Cooper racer Cristobal Carlyle. And as well as the memorabilia, an interactive tour tells you how the track's famous corners got their names. And the tech lab shows the science behind the sport and how race winning cars are made. And how about this? 
It's a replica of one of the cars that took part in the first ever race at Silverstone. The ERA GP1 could reach speeds of up to 170 miles an hour at a time where helmets were not compulsory and the drivers didn't even wear seat belts. Now, while I take it out for a spin, let's take another trip around Britain. Elodie Harper has been to meet Major Mick, a retired army major who's rowing across the UK's waterways in a homemade boat. Major Mick is rowing 100 miles across Britain in a tin boat he made himself. The stern is built from old shelving and everything is kept watertight by large amounts of builder's filler. This is made of two sheets of corrugated iron, um, three feet by six feet. And you can see I've got uh, the um, hose pipe, so 12 feet of hose pipe to hose. stop people cutting their fingers on it. So it's uh, lots of bits and pieces and, um, and, and here it is. In spite of being named the Tin Tannic 2, he's not expecting to sink. Do you ever get nervous in the boat? No, I never get nervous in the boat because I built it myself and I have every confidence in my ability to keep the water out. We caught up with Major Mick in Cambridge, but the retired Scots Dragoon has much bigger ambitions than that. So you've got three flags here. What, what, what are they representing? Well, they represent the places I'm going to. Uh, the first part of my challenge was to be in England. Uh, I've been to Wales, to Cardiff, and then Scotland. So it's showing so where it's you're showing, going? showing where I'm going, yes. Oh, fantastic. And where do yes. they go in the boat, then? Well, they go on the bars. Major started his journey in Henley, was filmed here in Cardiff in July, in Edinburgh in August, and will be finishing his odyssey in England to coincide with his 81st birthday at the end of September. All this rowing is to raise money for Alzheimer's Research UK, a charity close to his heart. I know so many friends and relations who have the horrible disease, and uh, it uh, uh, affects uh, not only the people who are inflicted with the disease, but their friends and family as well. And I feel that anything I can do towards the charity will be um, well received and will perhaps make a difference. He collects donations with a homemade net. Thank you very much, that's very kind of you. But his adventures are not only about the cash. Not all about money, you know, people are laughing and smiling at me and um, I have a great uh, uh, fun in chatting to people on the towpaths. If it all goes to plan, Major Mick hopes to raise around £20,000 for charity, as well as raising many people's spirits. Oh, you've got to love his spirit. And Major Mick is actually celebrating his 100 miles later this month, and we, of course, wish him the best of luck. Right, it's time for a short break, but when we come back, we'll be going head-to-head -head in the Battle of the Drift. And also a slight change of pace as we take a trip along one of the country's longest flight of locks. to all around Britain and the home of British motor racing, Silverstone Racetrack. In a moment, we'll be tyre smoking, wheel spinning and sideways driving as we learn the art of drifting. Yeah, I can't wait <laughs> for that. First, though, Kylie Pentelow has been navigating one of the longest continuous flights of canal locks in the country, Cane Hill in Wiltshire. It's spectacular from up here, and up close you can see just how much work we've got ahead of us. Luckily, I have a great team helping me out. John, hello. Heidi, hi. Nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you. So we're heading on a little trip. Yes. How many locks are we going to do today? We're going to do 16 locks. OK, and it's quite a trip, isn't it? Yeah, it really is, because they go one after another, after another, after another. So once we start, we can't stop. We don't stop. Yeah. And... Away we go. 
So we're actually going through the first lock now. Yeah. So it's 72 foot long and our boat's 55 foot. So we've actually got plenty, oh, wow. plenty of room to be in Oh, that here. sounded tight to me. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a distance to go down, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Um, and every lock height is a different level. Wow. So okay. I can oh, yeah, just I can say, feel yeah, it. down we go. Disappearing. As we make our way down our watery staircase, which of course helps boats travel uphill too, our team on land is getting all the locks ready for us, making the journey much smoother. One done, <laughs> 15 to go. <laughs> As John and the boat continue, I jump off to find out just how these locks work. The lock chamber is essentially like a large bath with two plug holes at that end. Uh, Obviously, the young chaps have just closed the sluices when they reclose the gates. Obviously, the sluices that end can be raised, refill the lock is necessary. OK. And where does the water go? Well, it goes downstream, obviously. But since August 96, we've been able to recycle the water, pump it back upstream so we can re reuse the same water again and again. That means this flight of locks can stay open seven days a week. Dog's enjoying it. <laughs> So as they head up, we continue our journey down. Is that number four? Four. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe number four. <laughs> There's still 12 locks to go. We're losing count already. <laughs> now, so far, I've been enjoying the ride. But as we make it just past the halfway point, it's time for me to get my hands dirty. And the paddle is starting to come up. Can I have a go? Yes, you can. Oh, are you joking? No. Oh, my goodness. Wow, that's actually really hard. Oh, you made that look easy. <laughs> so what do you, tell me what you're doing, Karen. Opening the gate. OK. You must make sure the boat's not in the way. I'm not helping, to be honest, am I? You're doing all the work, aren't you? OK, John. Now, I can't believe you're doing this, but you, you're going to let me have a go Absolutely. at... Absolutely. Steering. This is your time. It's called steering, is it? I guess steering will work. Oh my goodness. Well done. All the way. All the way, all the way. <laughs> now straight. Straight. Straight now. Straight. Yeah. So we're we're heading on in now. Yes. And what we've got to do is remember to stop. Let's go into neutral now. Neutral. There and we go. A little bit of reverse now. Because we want to slow her down. There's no brakes. The only way to brake is to reverse. Oh, hello. Oh, that was exciting. <laughs> right. And we just hit the lock then. Yeah. But that's okay. Yeah, that was more of a kiss. Okay, more of a kiss. More of a kiss <laughs> than a that. collision. Luckily, no proper crashes yet then, but just in case, these two were being kept out of my way with a little snack. And despite my lack of skills, John's letting me take the helm for the last locks. Ah, oh, beautiful. Amazing. You made it. <laughs> Yay! We did it! <laughs> Some masterful steering from Kylie there. And now it's time for us to get in the driver's seat. Although it's fair to say there's a bit of a change of pace of what we're about to do. Yeah, this is a lot more fast and furious. And in a moment, we're going to put our drifting skills to the test. But first, well, let's see how the professionals do it. <laughs> With 190 brake horsepower, the Catrium 7s are like little go-karts as they drift, slide and skid around the course. Driver Chaz Small is on hand to show us the ropes. <laughs> All that burning rubber, I mean, that must mean you're doing it right. Uh, it, it does help, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it looks good. It's, it's definitely uh, showing off. And how long have you done this for? Uh, around about... 18 years. Well, Alex and I couldn't come to Silverstone and not have a go of having a race. So, what do we need to know? First gear. OK. Makes it nice and easy. Yep. Uh, and lots of power. Right. So, who's going to go first, then? I think Alex. Good shout, Chaz. Off you go. <laughs> I reckon you guys have set me up. Right, so, uh, helmet on first. Indeed. It's very compact down. in there, isn't it, Chaz? It is very tight, God. yeah. Oh, it's a tight fit. Yeah, this will be sure. interesting to see how flexible you actually are. Hold <laughs> on. Oh. Are you ready? Right. So it's in first. Yep. And go. Oh, <laughs> 
Not that easy, is it? You need to regulate the throttle a little bit more. Now for your timed run. So, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Three, two, one, go! Good though, I was like, yes, come on. Oh no, you're gonna love this. Go on, get in, come on. Ooh, okay. <laughs> oh lordy. Can you get that clutch all the way down? What, that one? Yeah. No. <laughs> so it turns out that I can't actually have a go because I'm actually too short. So Chaz, because I still want the experience, are you gonna give me a go? Of course, I'll take you out. Yay. Hold on, what's going on here? <laughs> Hold on, no, no, no. That's not fair. Well, fate would have it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so fun! We totally won. Do you know what? <laughs> you have to forfeit the race because technically you didn't drive. Oh, come on, we totally won. Anyway, while we squabble about that, Paul Crone has been to meet an animal trainer so passionate about the mammals she looks after, she's gone back to school to study their whiskers. They're streamlined, super speedy in the water and fascinating to watch. But for animal keeper Dr Alex Milne at Blackpool Zoo, it's all about a sea lion's whiskers. Alex has fought off stiff competition from almost 2,000 other applicants to further her in-depth research into the whisker movement of seals and sea lions. I want to find out just how important they are for seals and sea lions they they do incredible things and we always like to find out lots of information about all animals all over the world and i've grew up with these 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 are my my babies so to speak so i want to do the best for them and hopefully develop some new things that help them out in the future my fellowship's going to involve me looking at sea lion and seal whiskers and um, through behavioral experiments mechanical models and robot platforms it took a good few months nearly a year of interviews documents presentations and obviously with the restraints of covid so everything was over zoom and skype it was a hard process um, to, to go through and quite challenging at times. The 34-year-old Liverpoolian has taken to a research well like a sea lion to a pool and is the first person to find out previously unknown whisker-related revelations. So we initially thought that it was the head placement that placed the sea lion's heads when they investigated their environment and we found out that it's actually these whiskers which we call vibrissae and they move them in different ways for different tasks and they can independently move them with all the muscles they've got on the end of their muzzle. Exploring this subject is a complex challenge so let's start with the basics. Now Gina here is a member of the pinniped family. Should I tell them what a pinniped is or shall you? All right I'll tell them. A pinniped is either a seal, a sea lion or a walrus. Is that right? Apparently so. And I didn't even get a fish for me aquatic expertise. And to be honest, it's best left to the experts. We're always striving to do better in the zoo world. We always want to learn more about our animals and how we can help them um, for conservation purposes. But for me and the whiskers, we can now develop enrichment devices to help their sensory systems. We can then take this work further to the agricultural world and we can help their whiskers with trying to find like cracks in pipelines via robotics so the opportunities are endless i've always wanted to work with marine mammals ever since i was a little girl and i've always wanted to dance with dolphins apparently that's what i used to say um, so they've always had a special place in my heart and i've been an animal trainer now for over 15 years and i, I wanted to give back to them the amazing life that they've given me 
amazing. And it looks like Paul's got a new best friend there. Also, I love the fact that you can see just how much sea lions and seals mean to Alex. We've had an incredible time here at Silverstone. Mm. We'll see you next week, but for now, enjoy the rest of your Sunday.